Hey everyone, it's Tim from Lenas Farm Specialty and Heirloom Livestock. Thanks for joining us again today. So today we're actually traveling off the farm. We are headed over to Rick Adams Farm over in East Central Illinois. Rick is an interesting fellow. He's been raising sheep his entire life and he's known well throughout the industry as a black-faced sheep breeder and he sells a lot of breeding stock. He sells a lot of show stock, but really the interesting thing about Rick is he kind of embodies what we would like to say is the lifetime learner kind of mentality. Every time I've ever gone to Rick's farm, he always has something new going on, some new information to share, and he really is on the ground level, if uh, I guess that's the best way to put it, on the ground floor level. When it comes to new breeds in the United States, finding new ways to breed, finding better breeds, uh, and just working with the sheep industry overall. So although Rick is a sheep guy, quote unquote, uh, a lot of the information that he's going to share with us today can be used both with sheep and goats, especially when it comes to feeding, some of the setups that he's going to show us and everything else. You know, this is most definitely not an all-inclusive video of what's going on on Rick's farm. Uh, we could spend probably a week on Rick's farm and still not see everything that there is to see or learn everything that there is to learn. This is uh, just a few basic topics that kind of popped up uh, spontaneously while we were at his farm, and I wanted to share it with you. I am 100% certain that we will be visiting his farm again in the future and have other information. This is the entirety of the video. Uh, we will also break down the video into more bite-sized segments, but with that being said, let's head on over to Rick's farm and see what is going on today. We're here with Rick Adams, and we are located in, I guess you'd call it, what, East Central Illinois? Yep. This is, the address here is Schwantz. I lived here for 35 years. I live somewhere else now, but we still operate the sheep farm here. So did you actually grow up here? In... I grew up three miles from here. Okay, so you've been raising sheep for? Uh, all my life, because my dad before me, he had horn dorsets. Oh, okay. And then when I was nine, we bought a small flock of Hampshires. And so I went all through 4-H with a small flock of Hampshires. And we've evolved into having multiple breeds now. So, you know, we love to pigeonhole people in the sheep industry. So normally when we, and you know this, when we talk about guys in, or gals in the sheep industry, we're like, oh, they're a Hamp guy or they're a Southdown guy. I always associated you and, and when people bring up your name, I hear blackface uh, because you you just did it for so long, right? So well, I've done blackface sheep all my life. And right. For a long time, we'd have been called club lamb producers because we sold a lot of club lambs over the years and had a lot of success doing that. But we've evolved beyond that. So for people that are that don't know what club lamb is, when we have to break down raising sheep into these different categories, if you had to break down raising sheep into, let's say, a handful of categories what would you call those categories? How would right, you define well, them? Well, there's the commercial industry where you raise lambs for the sole purpose of providing meat for the consumers or wool for the consumers. Right. And right now the wool markets, either you're very specialized in wool or your wool's not worth much. Those are the two commercial areas. Then there's the show arena and and the show arena breaks down into breeding stock for large breeds, mm -hmm. and then there's breeding stock for small breeds, off breeds, breeds that there's only a few of, and then there's club lamb. And I would say right now the club lamb industry and the show industry is probably the largest part of the show industry. And when I say club lambs, that's market lambs that I would sell to you for your kids to show at a county fair or a state fair or a big regional show. And that changes the the standards of what's desirable changes based on geographical location. So I know some areas of the United States show at different times of the year. Right. Um, and so there's there's nuances within the club lamb industry as well, right? Very much so. So here in the Midwest, our predominant shows are from county fair season, which now starts in June. It used to be an August thing, but now we start in June. We have a lot of jackpot shows a lot of regional shows, and then that kind of starts to wind down around Labor Day. But it still stretches out all the way to Louisville. There just aren't as many of them once school starts. So when you talk about Louisville, that's the big show, That right? is the big show for all categories. Gotcha. And that is uh, usually the second week of uh, November. 
down in Louisville, and it's called the North American. So we get a lot of questions from individuals that call us, to, and and they're looking for their kids to show in 4-H. And probably one of the biggest questions I get is, what's a market lamb? You know, people get confused about that. They say, well, I see all these different breeds, but then I see market lamb. So what 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 is that? Well, a market lamb is the lamb that you would be showing, and it could be of any breed or all breeds or cross breeds. But they're the they're the product that we would want to be desirable to sell to the consumer to eat. But it becomes its own little industry in that we're trying to produce lambs that have a lot of muscle, that are lean, that are structurally correct. Right. And it's evolved into you have certain kinds of lambs that do better in certain areas and, and it's it's all its own industry. So I get, a, I get this loaded question a lot and I think this is gonna kind of revert back to what we talked about as far as what's your geographical location and what's showing well in your area. Uh, people ask me a lot, they say, well, what breed do I need to get to be competitive? Now that's, a, I know that's, that's a, a tough a loaded one. question. So like here in Illinois, we don't have a lot of individual breed market shows, mm -hmm. but you go to Indiana, they have a lot of them. So if you wanted to show uh, a Dorper market lamb in Indiana, you would have all kinds of places where you could show that against just Dorpers. You would also have the big show where all the breeds would end up showing against each other. But if you were in Illinois, a black faced market lamb is going to have all the advantage and you're going to probably have them all showing against each other most of the time. You go to Texas and then it's fine wools and other commercials. We've seen a shift in breeds, uh, desirable breeds, I guess. I've seen a lot of Southdown guys transitioning into Dorpers, especially in the southern states. And it seems like I can almost watch some things that happen down south and it slowly kind of trickles up our way. Is Would that be accurate to say or does it go? It goes back and forth. So depending upon when... Texas didn't have a real organized showing market lamb system until you got into maybe the 1980s. The Midwest had a better market lamb showing system than they did. But then they were buying all these Midwest blackface sheep down in Texas and they developed a really big market lamb industry down there. Now they've passed us up and there's probably more Texas and Oklahoma producers where their stock comes to the Midwest than the other way around. Would you say it's a fair assessment on my part that I'm, see I'm seeing more and more hair sheep? If you would have talked to me five years ago, I would have said I'm seeing a lot of Katahdins, and now I keep hearing Dorper, Dorper, Dorper. All across the United States, I'm hearing more and more people talking about Dorper. Is that accurate for me to say that it, it is kind of an up-and-coming breed? And if so, well, what's driving this? Hair sheep in general are up-and-coming, and they really caught on in popularity a few years ago. And the big reason behind the hair sheep is you don't have to shear. And right now, commercial wool, coarse wool is, is almost valueless. Correct. So if you're paying six to $10 per head to shear an animal where you're only getting 50 cents worth of wool, it right. doesn't make a lot of sense on that part of the industry. So the hair sheep thing has be, has gotten big. And Katahdins and Dorpers are the two big hair breeds that are driving a lot of that. But the, there's other br hair breeds, but those are the two big ones. And that was kind of part of what brought us here today specifically to talk to you is, is I know we're a little bit different than you are. We run lots of different breeds because we educate lots of people. So I've mm -hmm. got 15 different breeds on my farm. I've got Rambouillets out of Heli out, out in Montana. I've got animals from all over the place, but you've always been, I guess I would consider you to be more open-minded about like, you like to try new things and say, well, how can I make this work? How can mm -hmm. I make things better? You're always kind of evolving. Right. And I know recently I've talked with you and you've had some new breeds that you've brought into your farm that are very unique, especially to the United States. And that's kind of what brought me here today. And so tell me a little bit about that. Well, let me give you a little evolution of where we've been. Okay. I was a blackface producer for lots of years. And then in the early 2000s, we, we put an equip project here on the farm in and we've got uh, 50 acres of fenced in pasture now. And the goal at that time was to produce more sheep and graze more sheep. Okay. So we added El de France at that time because I, I was, I was uh, intrigued with how tough they were. They could live in all kinds of environments and be productive. So we developed that El de France flock. It served us well, but there are sheep that you shear. My sheep shear was retiring the last couple of years. So we made a decision that we're gonna transition into a hair sheep 
Okay. So I started with a Katahdin ram, and we bred a lot of the Elder France used to the Katahdin ram, saved those 50 percenters. There are things about them I liked. They still need to be sheared because they're only 50 percent. Uh, but then the next progression was I bought a white Dorper ram so that I can breed those to the white Dorper ram, and we're getting the sheep now. We've only had one crop of that, okay. but we're getting lambs that don't need to be sheared. So when you're breeding a Dorper, and, and that's a, I, I'm interested in this because we've brought in a few white Dorpers from West Texas this year to our flock doing education. We felt, okay, we, we've got to bring these in. They're such high demand. We've bred them this past year on a club lamb style pulled Dorset. So when you're breeding a wool breed on a Dorper, what, should you expect? Are they still going to be uh, uh, in need of shearing or do they? Uh, yes. Okay. So we started with the Katahdin first because the Katahdins are better shedders than the Dorpers. So uh, in your dealing with Dorpers, you've probably seen these ewes. They, they shed everywhere, but they got a patch of wool in the middle of their back. And that's what we've got on ours. And that's what a lot of Dorpers do. Okay. So they shed everything good except for that. Katahdin will shed all of that. So that's why we started with a Katahdin. The Elder France ewes are short, thick, muscular ewes to start with. The Katahdin's, the one I used, had a little more frame. He's a really good shedder, and that's why we started there. Now, with the Dorper on those crosses, we are getting sheep that will shed, which amazes me that in just two crosses we can yeah. do that. Yeah, that's that's fast. That's fast. That's right. faster than I expected. Right. Yeah, normally when we look at when we look at genetic changes, most people don't realize like this is a long, slow process that involves a lot of culling. You know, you've really got to keep your eyes on these animals and, and really focus in on what it is that you want. Get rid of the ones that you don't, keep the yeah. ones that you do. So it's it's years. Right. Um, so that's amazing. That, yeah, so that's yeah. amazing to me that that happened so fast. We had talked on the phone and you had said that you have a a you very unique buck. Right. I, so, well, I don't want to say buck, people get confused. I, I say ram. Uh, you have a there's, very unique. We can still call them bucks. Right. Yes. So you have a very unique ram here yes. on the farm. So right. tell me so, about him. So in the progression now after the white dorper ram, my, my plan is I got intrigued by a breed called Australian white. I've never heard of that. Yeah. They're very new to this country. There's, there's uh, one guy in Alabama who has uh, imported uh, semen and embryos here, and he's developing the breed here in the United States, and that's Fagerman Farm in Alabama. And I've been following him, and then this last year he had a sale where he sold some Australian white rams, and I was able to get one bought. So I have that's the next ram in the progression is to use the Australian white on these half Dorper quarter Katahdin quarter El de France ewes and develop that, and, and we're going to breed up into an Australian white flock. I've heard of royal whites. Is this different? This yeah. is different than royal white. So the Australian whites were developed from basically four breeds in Australia, but the main contributor was the white dorpers okay. in Australia. And they look a lot like American white dorpers, except for they're a little bigger. They probably shed a little better. So this is like better. Am I putting my foot in my mouth to say uh, this? I, I, if, let's not let's not say that they're better than white dorpers. They're different. Yeah. The last breed that I really knew of that was a really successful cross in recent years would be a polypay. Polypay was an, an American invention of, of bringing four breeds together, and the goal behind that was to have a sheep that could have lots of lambs, do it out of season, produce a high quality wool, and be the uh, really good commercial ewe in the United States. So, and, and they kind of have done that out west. Yes, so the four-way cross with a polypay, and this is a four-way cross from Australia, yes. what was their goal when they made this four-way cross in Australia? What was their end well, goal if you had to? Their goal was that they weren't to be sheared. They also were looking for eating quality. So they're promoting themselves as the Wagyu of lamb. Okay. Okay, so uh, lots of good intramuscular fat is what promotes good eating quality. And uh, easy to do that on not a lot of feed. And in Australia, there's a real big push that everything's got to be white so that if you're clipping, you don't have any black fibers in the wool. Oh, I did not know that. But that's becoming less important over there. But that was another reason why they wanted them to be white. So they didn't, so that their, their fibers didn't mix with and be the wrong color in the wool clip. Gotcha. But 
the people that are producing these, they don't even have any wool sheep, so it didn't really matter. Awesome. Can I see the yes, uh, let's, uh, let's go take a look. Let's go right. walk over there. Justin. I saw a feeder like this at a friend of mine in Indiana's, and, and this is actually built by clean pipe structures okay. in Indiana, and I had it custom made to what I wanted. So this is just a bunk feeder. Uh, these are like 36 inches wide, I think, and, and the spaces are just right for the sheep, and I just hooked them up together into a runway, nice. and I just walk, this is my walkthrough, right. and I feed through here. And it's super easy to clean this out, too. You get yeah. a flathead shovel and yep. scoop it out and It'll be scoop done. right out, so yeah, it works great. These are, what are these? Okay, so this is my pen of ewe lambs. They're gonna be kept for this next year in okay. the commercial flock. So the Australian white ram is in here, and then there are some half katahdins okay. in here. They've been sheared, so they're a little harder to pick out the half katahdins. Right. But if you, if you look, um, like there's a half katahdin. Right. You can see that she's got more hair around her legs and neck and head and belly. Right. But she's still got wool. Right. And that's what a lot of the half Katahdins look like. Half Elle de France, half Elle, half Katahdin. Right. And the ones that are all wool are the Elle de France. And then there are these that are not sheared at all. Those are out of the Dorper Ram and the half Katahdin ewes that I have. So you can see, yeah, they still have a little wool, but they're, they're gonna be fairly good shedders. And by the time they're mature sheep, I believe they'll shed that all out and be fairly slick. And there's, I think, four or five of them in here. And they've, you've got some some nice long tubular body styles in here. So even some of these that I'm looking at right now would even show decent. I mean, and of course these have well, been picked we, over pretty well, right? I mean, these are yeah. There's 25 ish in here, and we probably had uh, 120 ewe lambs right. that we picked these out because we we had right at 250 commercial lambs this year. So when you're picking, and I, I know we could have a five hour conversation about this, but just general, when you're picking out which which ones were gonna make the cut, mm -hmm. what what is it that you're really what is it that you're really looking at? Well, on the on the half dorpers, kept them all because we only had five. So we're just getting going on that. On the half katahdins, the the emphasis is the ones that had more hair in them and still had some structure that that I like. I like thick muscular sheep but katahdins are not thick and muscular sheep. I got particular on my half katahdins that they had to carry some thickness from the Elder France, and I wanted to also have more hair, right. because the goal is to eventually be shedders and not shear. So there's maybe 10 in here that are half katahdin, and that's it. I had a lot more than that to pick from. But sure. yeah, because because that's new in the process, we're, we're uh, being tougher on that part. And we'll become tougher on the half Dorper part this next year. Do you usually pick one attribute at a time, work on that? You might put emphasis on one or two things, but you want to you want to have a good sound animal to start with. Do Ile de France uh, milk well? Very well. Okay. Ile de France are a French Texel, and they are excellent milkers. And they, because my Ile de France's aren't pure, there's some Dorset in there, commercial yeah. style Dorset, so they're mm -hmm. excellent milkers. Very good. Yes. All right. So your male is in here. Male is in here, and this is the male right here. He was born in late February. And oh, I've so got, he's still young. He's still very young. And I put him in with these so that we can get some lambs out of him since he's new. I wanted a, a, a chance to get some lambs. Normally, these ewes would not get bred as ewe lambs because uh, I would be developing them outside on pasture, and they would need more nutrition to be pregnant. But I decided since I wanted lambs out of him, I would feed these more, develop them faster, so that I could get some lambs. So as far as feed conversion from what you've seen with his breed, do they They're very similar to the Dorpers in that they can get fat easily on not a lot of feed. So the guy that I bought him from in Alabama, they don't have very good grass in Alabama, and he says they'll right. keep their flesh on their poor grass and he, he feeds very little grain to his and when I was there he had several hundred lambs. He has a finishing floor that's okay. all slotted and his lambs were great shape and they were getting, uh, they were fed in a bunk and it was almost all forage and they were in great shape. So this is not a lot of use but this is what this is where it's headed is to use like this that will shed. Temperament wise what have you noticed with him? Is he flighty? Is he calm? Is he aggressive? He's, he's not breeding? flighty, not afraid of me. For the age he is, he's probably too familiar. Okay. In other words, he's not a problem now, but as he gets older, I wonder if he could be. Because usually when a ram lamb like this isn't afraid of you, 
they're, they're the ones that's gonna become the pest in the future. And we've talked about that a lot with our viewers. A lot of people want to overhandle their males. And, mm -hmm. and we tell people, it seems like when they're lambs, the males tend to be a little bit more curious and a little bit more apt to come up to you. And for people that don't know, that opens them up to wanting to overhandle them. And then they end up with a little monster that wants to clobber them they when, they, when they get older. become more of a problem as they get older. Right. Yes. And so when you're looking at him, you say, you know, that's something that you're going to want to keep your eye on. With right. Him. Okay. But now that part of that's because he was individually penned for a long time. He was got more attention than he probably should have at first. Now that he's in with yous, he gets less attention. That'll he'll probably not be a big problem. So how big do you expect him to get as far as finishing out? Um... When he when he's mature, I saw his sire, and uh, his sire was probably 280 pounds at a mature weight, and I expect him to to be similar. So they don't get real tall, but they're real thick and they're real long. So as far as the breed itself, are you the only person in the Midwest that has one? No, there are other people that have them now. There's a, a, a good sized flock in Missouri that, that has quite a few. He's been selling sheep to other flocks and so it's starting to expand, but it is relatively new. There are not very many. So these, you would expect these to lamb when? Uh, these are gonna lamb in mid, April to mid-May, because he's been in about 30 days and we're gonna take him out in another week. So we'll come back when they lamb, and I guess we'll both kind of be seeing what, what we we'll, got, we'll right? See, yeah, okay. they'll be, well, because they're lambs, they're not all gonna get pregnant. Hopefully some of those that are half dorper get pregnant, because that's the progression I wanna see. Now the others are so that we can start making more lambs, and I wanna see how much are they gonna shed, how thick are they gonna be, how, are, how fast are they gonna grow, things like that. My main market on these lambs now is uh, a 70 pound lamb, a hot house lamb or, or a party lamb, they call them uh, party lambs, weekend lambs. I got a place that'll buy every one I got and they pay very well for them. And so right now that is what is in high demand is those lightweight lambs that have some finish on them. And yeah. I think these will be ideal for that. This is the Australian white ram that I bought. He was born uh, in late February, and uh, so that means he's uh, probably nine to 10 months old. And he's well mature for nine to 10 months old. He probably weighs 130 pounds, give or take. And the goal is to produce uh, 75 pound lambs out of him. Now, what I like about him is, even as a lamb, you can see that he's very good hair on his lower half and his throat. And the wool that he has here, it's, it's not all wool. It's, it's part wool, part hair. And I believe that as he gets mature, this will shed when he's mature. So I, when, But I was sold on the idea that, that this was the direction I wanted to go. So when you're looking at body itself and what you like, well, can you- What I like on him, structurally he's very correct. If you look at his feet and legs, they're nice and straight up and down. Right. They, they're on all four corners. They don't hock in. He's got good width between them too. And so a sheep that has width between its front legs and its rear legs has good natural width. And he's also wide across here. And this is the most important piece of meat is right here. So you want there to be width here right. and muscle in that. And then you want the hips to be square and have muscle in the hips. And, and so he's very straight lined and he's very good on his feet and legs. So structurally he's very good. Uh, he doesn't have the big dip behind his shoulders that you see in a lot of the more muscular sheep. Right. Which, which is more aesthetically pleasing, doesn't mean they're better, but it just looks better. Now, if you were to get into the show, that again, that's a completely different animal, but long flat back is a more desirable if you start breaking. In, in most breeds, but in the, in the Dorper breed, right. they don't mind if they break in the back, as long as it's not terrible. Gotcha. Yeah. Now, as far as how the neck comes up out of the shoulders, what are you looking for up in here? I, you know, a showier animal will have them come up higher and, and they'll have a higher head. Okay. But we're not keeping him for showing. This sure. is for producing meat. So you want them to have just enough neck to be functional. Right. You don't have to have them be the super long neck and pretty. Now in an online sale... It's more, it's more important for them to have length of body. In, a, in an online sale, you're counting on that farm that you're buying them from to do the basic stuff for you, right? Checking their bite, making sure that their bite is correct, making sure that yeah, I would hope that they're not putting those kinds of animals in a sale, uh, that they don't have inverted eyelids, right. that their testicles aren't split. Right. You know, all those basic things that you look for in a ram, 
that, that they've already kind of sorted those all out. They also, they had videos of the Ram in the online sale. So I got to watch the video of the sheep moving. And, and so that's what I liked about this sheep. He was a good, free, easy mover, and he had a lot of muscling. And you could catch that out of the video. When you get your hands on him, he's got a lot of power. He's very, he's actually thicker than I thought. And, yes. then, and then I, you know, I have a harder time. You're probably much better at looking through the wool or looking through the hair than I am. That's an art. Yeah, that um, takes that takes experience right. and time. Yep. Uh, but getting my hands on him, he is, he's a stout fellow. Yes. So that is, uh, that is good. He is a good looking guy and especially for his age. So yeah, yeah. I think, he, I think when he's done growing, he's going to be pretty good size. But yeah, you can see yeah, he's kind of got a, a cap of wool right now, but he's still a lamb. My experience is that that comes off better with age. There's there's one of the half dorper ewes right here in front that I really like. This one right here? Yes. Yeah. I think she's really, really nice. Yeah, she looks really nice. All right. And she, she doesn't look that different from him. No, she doesn't. She doesn't. No. So if I can produce that kind of thick, fast-growing lamb that sheds, that's what I want. These are some of my black faced ewes. When we got done shearing, these ewes were on the thinner side. So I sorted them off. Uh, we were very dry this summer, ran out of grass. So grazing got tight and tough and, and these ewes weren't as fat as I would have liked. So as soon as, soon as I sorted them off, I started self feeding them. And so in that hog feeder that you can see down there, I have soy holes. And soy holes are, there's no starch in soy holes. And so they're, they are not uh, an acidosis risk. So you can, you can feed them like they are roughage. So you can feed them the same as hay and they're not gonna overload on them. They're not gonna get the acidosis problem that you would with corn. And yet their energy level is as good as corn. So lots of available energy without the risk for the acidosis. And so what I do then is, and I also do this at other production stages, I will feed them full feed soy holes when they've got baby lambs on them. I did these because they were thinner and I wanted to put some weight on them. Soy holes mix in just 10% corn and a protein pellet to bring the protein up to 14% uh, okay. on the ration and let them eat all they want. And right now they're getting uh, round bales of corn stalks okay. for roughage and some coarse hay for roughage and all the soy holes they want. And I've, they've gained weight very well. I've never seen this, Rick, with the round bales of corn. So that's fulfilling the rumen it, uh, needs as far as producing, uh, producing the saliva keeping that room and cooking it's yep. lots of good roughage how well do they actually go after that I Oh, they, well, if the hay wasn't in here, they'd eat more of it. Right. But I learned that on a tour of uh, the Pipestone project okay. over in Minnesota. We went to farms and there'd be ewes on full feed uh, soy holes with lambs on them. And the only roughage they were getting was the corn stalk bales. That was it. No kidding. And you set the corn stalk bale in the pen, it becomes bedding. They rummage through it, eat what they like, and it fulfills all their their roughage, huh. their po the pokey roughage portion of their diet, you know, so that their rumen is active, it fulfills all that. Very cool. And, it, and it's a very balanced diet by doing it this way. So there's not much corn in this per se, it's just stalks. Let's talk briefly about mold. Moldy hay, moldy feed, that's a no-go for sheep, right? Like you can well, get serious it, problems with that? You can have, and that all depends on stage of production. Pregnant use, mold is a big problem. Open use, it's not as big a deal. Use that are nursing lambs, it's, a, it's not as big a problem in them because the mold issues affect pregnancies more than anything else. If you get a lot of mold, then it, they're not even gonna wanna eat it. Corn stalks, we don't get mold in corn stalks because okay. it's really, really dry in the fall when we bale them and then they're net wrapped when we bring them in, you know, so yeah, they're really dry. They're great bedding. Yeah, we use it for bedding. It comes up easier. It doesn't layer and interweave like right. the straw wool. It tears apart nicer when you're cleaning. Right, and the other thing that we've found with ours is what we can do in some of our pens is we can actually, if it gets too compacted, we can actually take a rototiller in and till it up mm -hmm. and get it fluffy again, and then uh, let them run it again, and it actually works fairly well. We've had pretty good it's luck with that. similar to the big bedding packs the dairies like to use, deep bedding, right. and they just go in and they till it, and right. it helps dry it out and refresh it, and you can use it over and over. So I guess two questions for you. First one is, when you're looking at, I teach our newer people, um, our newer customers, our newer viewers about putting their hands over the rib cage and feeling the fat cover over the ribs to kind of get a feel for body condition. I tell people, you know, if it feels like your fingers, it's a little too thin. If it feels like the top of your 
arm, it's too bad, and yeah, I want it to good, feel like the back of your hand, right? A good, a good rule of thumb is if if the ribs or the spine feel like that, uh -huh. that's too thin. Right. If the spine feels like this, that's on the thinner side. Right. If it feels like that, it's about right. If it feels like this, they're getting too fat. Right. So how do you... When you were saying earlier, you said they were getting a little too thin for you. Now you can look at them and mm -hmm. see, but for the average person, they would want to lay their hands on them and right. get a feel for that fat cover on their ribs, right? Yeah. And I think a lot of people, a lot of new people, especially goats seem to bloat more than our sheep do. I think sometimes people look at the belly and say, oh, well, they're fat because yeah. they got this big belly, but really we're looking at their fat cover on the ribs. Right. The, the size of the belly it just tells you how full they are right. or how much feed they have in their gut. The real measure of fat is over the ribs and over the spine. The next thing I want to ask and probably the biggest pushback we get, we get different camps of people uh, throughout the United States and, and people that are just on pasture, just on uh, confinement. The number one thing that I'm going to get from our viewers when it comes to feeding like pellets is they're going to say, I can't, I can't afford to do that. And so I think that's not an accurate assessment. I think I think the reality is is you have to look at what you're getting out of what you're feeding. You know, you can right. feed just hay, but if it takes you twice as long, three times as long, you may it may seem like you're coming out ahead financially, but you're really not. Um, Depends it, on how high how, how high a quality hay you have and what it costs you to buy. Right. If you got to buy all your feedstuffs, then then corn's probably the cheapest feedstuff you can buy because it's so nutrient dense and you can limit the amount that they get and you can probably add more weight per dollar spent using corn so but, but you can't feed just corn so when when people say take creep feeding for example and i don't want to get too far off the beaten path here but you know creep feeding versus no creep feeding um i tell people if you're raising for production you know you want to get them as big as you can as fast as you can health healthy you mm -hmm. know we don't want to blow them up but I haven't found a way to do that without creep feeding. Well, there there are ways to do that on pasture that's kind of like creep feeding. You let your lambs go through a creep gate onto the really good pasture and they eat the nice little bits out before their mothers come and then you move that gate forward, let the mothers have that after lambs have. Gotcha. And the lambs are getting the better end of it before the mothers are. That makes sense. That's just like creep feeding, right. but, it, but it's a different kind of feed. If you're going to be inside and feeding, then creeping lambs is a great way to get them off to a faster start. What breed are these? Are these a, kind of a mix? They are Hampshire's and Shropshire's, mostly Hampshire's. What's the protein percentage in the soy holes? That's The holes themselves are about 11% protein. And to bring up that protein, are you introducing a soy? A I, I use meal? a soybean pellet, soybean meal pellet. We can look at this feed. You can see there's only a little bit of corn in there. Mm -hmm. And then the bigger pellets are the soy holes and the fines are the soy holes too. Now, if you, if you were to limit soy holes, they choke. Okay. In other words, it gets in their mouth, it's dry and fluffy, that mixes with saliva, and they start to choke. They, they try to eat it too fast. When you say limit feed, what do you mean? I mean, you go once a day and you throw a bucket in the feeder, and they're, and scarfing, they, and they're it scarfing it down as fast as they can, Right. that they'll choke. That's why I full feed it, because they come up here and eat a little at a time, they don't choke. I will allow this to run out so that they clean this up, and that way I'm not wasting quite so much. Gotcha. But this is just an old hog feeder. Yeah, and we've had really good luck with these. We use these. They don't rust. Uh, they work great. We've had really good luck with the... Um, and, and for now, while the people are getting out of the hog industry, there's all kinds of them cheap. Yes, yeah, for what? 10 years from now, there won't be any. How many users are in here, ballpark? 24. How fast will they burn through this? It'll take them four days to eat this feeder down. But this is, probably holds eight or nine bushels. So they're they're eating between six and seven pounds a piece a day. Clots. But I want them to gain weight, too. Clostridium 
you know, we've, we talked to people a lot about why, why vaccinate against clostridium. Historically, you know, when I was a kid, it was always referred to as overeating disease. Right. Is it important if you're going to have animals on a free choice feed to have them vaccinated against clostridium? If this was corn, yes. But because it, there's no starch and the sugar levels in this are low, it's, it's all digestible fiber. So it doesn't go into that part of the stomach that causes the clostridium disease. And a lot of people don't realize clostridium disease itself is basically an imbalance that occurs in the gut bacteria right. that causes things to just go out of control. And, and, so, then, and then what happens is it, it more or less you over nitrify the blood system and that's what kills them. And very fast death mm -hmm. in a lot of cases if they get it. And we see that happen more maybe in animal. And you had touched on this about how, you know, you couldn't limit feed them. You had to, you have to have it open like this. We see that a lot. Uh, well, you could limit feed it, but you get more choking. So when we see clostridium rear its ugly head, we usually see unvaccinated animals that aren't accustomed to eating feed in this manner, mm -hmm. they break into something, they get into something they're not supposed to, and they just gorge themselves yeah. on on a high sugar or a high protein, high starch. high starch feed, and then it gets them. I got a, a customer of mine who buys a lot of lambs for slaughter, and, and, his, and he has a feedlot where he feeds lambs for a while, and so there's lambs coming in and out all the time. Okay. And he was have he puts them on full feeder because it's simpler for him. Right. But he would have occasions where if lambs come in that weren't used to eating a, a high starch diet, they get sick. Might not kill them, but they'd be set back for a time. We developed a ration for him that was high in soy hulls, and now he has no problems with lambs on full feed even though they're constantly being changed, coming in new and going out. For someone that doesn't know and just thinks all soybeans and all soybean feed is uh, cut from the same cloth, can someone just go to a farm and get raw soybeans and just feed them to their animals? You can feed raw soybeans to your sheep and other ruminants and they will process them, but they won't get 100% of the value out of them without them being cooked. Okay, and now some animals can't have raw soybeans at all. You it'll... can't feed raw soybeans to things like chickens and pigs that have the monogastric stomach. This is a round bell feeder that you can't buy anymore. Ha, okay. <laughs> There's... There, there's a guy over by Eureka who couldn't find a round bale fe feeder that he liked for his sheep. So he got out his welder and he built one. Okay. And then he wanted another one because it worked so good. And so he built several for himself and then his neighbor saw it and he built a few more. And so here in, in central Illinois, there's quite a few of them, okay. but he doesn't build them anymore. Oh, geez. But they work great. I see that. So essentially, it, you've got a sliding wall yep. that they eat their way into it. Yes, and if and this sliding wall, and there's other brands that do this, but it's six inches off the ground, so as they eat, they eat it out and it'll push in. And, and they're slanted bars, so you know they don't pull. If you had really nice hay, they'd take a chunk and they'd pull it out and they'd drop it on the ground and then it's wasted. Right. And, and it'll come apart by the pins. But this guy was thinking a lot when he built these because he's got that little stop there. Yeah. And it's well built. I see that. This I bought this feeder used, and I've had it 10 years. It's a great feeder. And I can't get one. And you can't get one unless you go find somebody that's done using it. Right. Or I get a fab guy to make one for me, I right. guess. Right. I've had pe people take pictures of them so they can make them. Okay. Yeah, that's Because it's genius. real basic. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's very smart. Huh. And would you say this is, is the best you've found for protecting from waste? Well... They're better at protecting from waste, but they're harder to work with, and the sheep have to work at getting the feed out. So there's there's a trade-off between waste and the sheep being able to eat. No matter how you do it on a round bale like this, you're going to get some waste. What you waste versus what benefit you get out of volume feeding, it's well worth this. Do you feed the same kind of hay throughout the year, generally speaking? No, I save my best hay for when the we're lactating. Uh, this is really rough hay. It's first cutting grassy hay. It's not very nice, but right now, nutritionally, all it's all they need out of this is to is to help poke the rumen and sure. and and keep them full. If you let your sheep be picky, they will. Yes. Be. Yeah, we know that. Yeah, we know that. <laughs> so what do we have in here? This is the blackface U family here, <laughs> Hampson Shrops. These these are going out and eating 
on the pasture. My hay fields that I baled all summer, let them go dormant and they're cleaning them up now. So that's kind of like free feed and same bedding, cornstalk bedding. And I uh, very close to lambing on some of these. I decided that I'd start feeding them a little more. So they're getting the soy holes. How free far, choice for how them far out too. are they from lambing? Uh, there's some in here that were AI that are only three weeks from having lamps. You have to kind of look for them, but there, there's one with an udder right. right there. And so she's she's three weeks. We're gonna have like 25 ewes have lambs in three weeks. Okay. So some are in here and some are in that other thin pen. So what's the goal with these lambs? Are these gonna be more show lambs? These are gonna be more show lambs and for the Shropshire breeding stock that we sell. What would you say is the average age of the ewe that's in here? Everything in here is between two and seven or eight. And there's going to be a few individuals that are nine. I think I've got one in here that's 10. Is there a sweet spot in the age where you say this is the magic age or this is the window that I expect to get the most productivity out of a ewe? I would say they're most productive from the first time they lamb, whether it's as a lamb or a yearling, they have more singles. They start to have more twins the next time. So as a two-year-old up till about six is when they're the most productive. Six, they're still very productive, but at seven, you start to notice that some are being able to handle it better than others. And at eight, we start to thin out fast. And those really good ones stick around till they're 10 or 11. What's I know the, my neighbor's got one that's 14 and still going. Really? Yeah. But you don't get a lot of them. I see. And and there are some breeds that are different than others. Right. White face shoes will last longer than black face shoes. I did not know that. Yeah, you've got some nice looking ewes in here. You've got some ewes in here with a lot of length. I'm seeing. You've got some that have a lot of hip, and they should. You've obviously kept them for your breeding stock, mm -hmm. so this is going to be kind of the choice ones that you've kept. Try um, try to keep straighter tops. Right. And square on their feet and legs. And that's what the that's what the industry calls for. For when you're showing, you got to have thickness and, and correctness. Now, your breeding males, do you keep all of them? Right now, they're pretty much all penned together okay. or in another barn because we're, we're, we're done with all the breeding except for on a few of the commercial sheep. We will try and have some fall lambs, so come April, we'll do some breeding groups to get some fall lambs. Predominantly, we, we lamb from December to April. And there's a monster you back there in the back that I see. Yeah, she's the biggest you we got. Holy smokes. Tell me about her. Well, she was born in 2016. You can see her. So she's a 2016 model? Yes. We raised her. She was shown by a friend of ours, okay. his daughter. They showed her for two years. Uh, did really well with her. We, we, we flushed her once. She's really good. We wanted more of her. Right. We didn't get any live babies out of that. So we spent thousands <laughs> doing that. Got nothing. Right. Uh, since then, we've been, uh, she doesn't lamb early. She lambs late. Of course. <laughs> And we've never gotten one as nice as her, out of her. Wow. That's how show yous are, isn't it? Yes, it is. <laughs> it is. But boy, she's something to look at. And, and so she's about seven years old? Yeah, she'll be seven. Kind of what you were saying there that some people may not understand is that when you say uh, she doesn't lamb early, that can hurt you as far as show because you want a little bit earlier lamb that right. has some time to develop before show. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that's a genetic thing. She just, right. you, you know, sheep, sheep are sensitive to the day length for getting pregnant. Right. And she's extra sensitive and she doesn't lamb till March without without making her lamb earlier right. through other manipulation. All right, so I'm Tim from Lonis the Farm Specialty and Heirloom Livestock here with Rick Adams. We appreciate all your time today. Thank yep. you. Thank, Thank you, you very, very much. much. And uh, if people want to get in touch with you, do you offer farm tours? Do you offer sales? How, what would yeah, you? Yeah, we, we, we offer, if anybody wants to come and look at what we got, we're fine with people coming and looking. If you okay. want to buy something, we've always got stock for sale. Outstanding. So I'm going to put contact information for Rick. If you want to check out the link below, we're going to link all the contact information for Rick. If you have any questions, comments, or concerns, make sure to let us know. If you have any specific questions, comments, or concerns for Rick, contact him and let him know. And we look forward to seeing all of you again next time. All right.